Got another really short one for you today for James Joyce's short story, um, Araby. Um, we've been going through the literary analysis and last time we talked really briefly about um, irony. And today, um, now we're gonna talk really briefly about contrasts. Um, this is something that's often um, sort of brushed aside or not looked at as, a, as much as important. Um, this is sort of a, a catch-all though of all the different kinds of contrasts you can have in literary works. You can have contrast between characters. So you could have a character that is opposite or quite different from the main character and they're being set up as a foil. Um, someone who represents um, some different uh, characteristics. You could also have contrast in the setting. So the setting could change dramatically. Um, you could even have contrast in, in the way that you have figurative language, like similes and metaphors. But really what we're talking about here is um, a contrast within a scene or a, a specific juxtaposition of things. Contrast is easy because you don't need to have words for it. Um, you don't need to know the fancy literary techniques. You don't need to know the, names of the, the names of the devices. All you need to know is, wow, they're setting up things to be different here. Um, so that's why I just wanted to do a quick little note about contrast because contrast is so universal. It applies to everything. You could talk about anything you read and discuss the contrasts that are going to be evident in it. It sort of plays into one of our, you know, base uh, understandings as humans is understanding differences and understanding that by looking at differences or looking at how things contrast, you actually have a better understanding of it. And that, in fact, these differences don't represent two separate identities or two separate entities, but rather two sides of the same coin. We, we as humans aren't one dimensional, we have many dimensions. And so the contrasts that are evident within ourselves, within stories, within characters, within scenes, leads us to a better understanding of the text and of ourselves as a whole. Especially um, evident in this is that last time we found out that the protagonist had been given a florin to go to the bazaar. And a florin is a coin that, of course, is going to have two sides. So it kind of is a little bit symbolic here, and we'll get to that later. Um, but um, we're going to talk about the contrast. So he gets to the bazaar, and um, he gets off the train, and he says, I could not find any sixpenny entrance. And fearing that the bazaar would be closed, I passed in quickly through a turnstile, turnstile, <laughs> turnstile, handing a shilling to a weary looking man. I found myself in a big hall girded at half its height by a galley. Nearly all the stalls were closed, and a greater part of the hall was in darkness. I recognized a silence like that which pervades a church after a service. I walked into the center of a bazaar timidly. A few people were gathered around the stalls, which were still open, before a curtain over which the words Café Chantant were written in colored lamps. Two men were counting money on a slaver. I listened to the fall of coins. Remembering with difficulty why I had come, I went over to one of the stalls and examined porcelain vases and flowered tea sets. At the door of the stall, a young lady was talking and laughing with two young gentlemen. I remarked their English, ac English accents and listened vaguely to their conversation. Lots of contrast here. So, of course, we know that this young character himself um, comes from sort of an impoverished part of Dublin. And normally he would find the six penny entrance, which is um, a much cheaper way. But because he's so scared that he's going to lose his chance to be at the bazaar, he pays a whole shilling. So he's coming out of his normal lifestyle where he'd pay a six penny and he's paying a whole shilling. So we see this contrast here between class, between economic status. Um, we also see that there's a contrast in how he's depicting it. He, he says that the silence of the bazaar is like a church after a service and he enters the center of the bazaar timidly. So of course, church is a place of reverence, of prayer, of thinking, and a bazaar is a place of 
economy and selling and haggling and arguing and people. And so we get this disparity, this contrast here between the church and between the bazaar, this marketplace. So they're kind of rubbing against each other. Of course, the silence after a service is, is that moment after all the holiness has left and it is just eerie and echoey. And you would think a bazaar would be opposite of that, you know, bustling. But really, he's come so late that it is quiet. So there's that interesting contrast there. Then um, we know that he's listening to these folks who are English. And remember, he's an Irishman. This is set in Dublin. And so as he's overhearing them, he's going to sort of listen in to how they're talking and how they're discussing things. And it is going to provide a contrast. He's coming from his own Irish background, the Irish culture, and he's in the Araby, which is, you know, the Eastern influence, and he's listening to these people with English accents. All of this sort of um, is under the, the thumb of colonization here, the colonization of um, the Middle East, the colonization of um, Arabia, um, of, of other places as well you get the porcelain and the flowered tea sets that call to mind the colonization of, of China. Um, and then, you know, the colonization of Ireland by the English. Sorry to take a tangent into history here, but there's lots of contrast going on culturally. Um, and then he finally is listening into their conversation. Oh, I never said such a thing. Oh, but you did. Oh, but I didn't. Didn't she say that? Yes, I heard her. Oh, there's a fib. Observing me, the young lady came over and asked me, did I wish to buy anything? The tone of her voice was not encouraging. She had seemed to have spoken to me out of a sense of duty. I looked humbly at the great jars that stood like Eastern guards at either side of the dark entrance to the stall and murmured, no, thank you. So now look at the contrast of the dialogue. They're gossiping, they're, they're talking about what's going on, they're having this back and forth. And of course, we haven't really had much dialogue. This is, this is dialogue here without any um, name markers, without saying then he said this and then he said this. And then we finally get another murmuring, really, from our protagonist who just says, no, thank you. So he's amped up going to this bazaar the whole time. He really wants to buy things, he wants to go. And then the first time he gets there, no, thank you. He doesn't want to do anything. So we get this contrast between the way that the dialogue is happening. You know, they're so, um, you know, engaged in conversation. And the minute he's asked to speak, he doesn't want to. No, thank you. And then, you know, the contrast in how he had been talking it up earlier. He's so excited to go. He wants to go so badly. He's got the money. Do you want to buy anything? No. And so we're seeing again his sort of removal from the world. He, he's so meek and shy and quiet and doesn't know how to express himself. Um, so that's just some, some examples of the way that you can talk about contrast. Um, even if you're not sure how to address other literary elements, you can always talk about contrast. Um, so that's where we're going to stop for today. Um, and then we're going to come back with a little bit more next time.